1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to begin reading in verse number 4. And these are about the gifts of the Spirit. And uh, verse 4 begins, now, are, uh, now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation, manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For the one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame Spirit, dividing to every man, to every man severally as he will. The word severally means individually. Verse 12, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether it be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. Uh, for the body is not one member, but many. And if the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ears shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? The whole body were hearing, where were the smelling. But God, but now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they are all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, but yet one body? And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more, those of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. That there should be no schism, that is division, in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. But all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, the answer, of course, to all those questions is no. Verse 31, But covet honestly the best gifts, earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show unto you more excellent way. Now, let's go back and the first three verses talks about the foundation of the church. And the foundation of the church is the lordship of Jesus Christ. No man can say that Jesus is Lord he said, but by the Spirit. And so the Lordship of Christ, he is Lord of the church. He's Lord of the body. He is the, you notice he didn't talk about the head, because Christ is the head of the body. 
He is the brains. He is the one who controls everything. And so he is the foundation of the church. In, in the Corinthians uh, here itself, in chapter 3, I think, it says, There is no other foundation laid than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So he is the foundation. This, this church building right here has a foundation. It is set upon a foundation of blocks. And uh, in the uh, fellowship hall, that's a slab, but it's built and, uh, the, upon a concrete slab. And so that's why Christ is. He, is. he is the things upon which our lives, our church, everything is built upon the fact that he is Lord and he is controlling, and that is the foundation of the church. The strength of the church is also found in these thir- uh, first three verses. And that is every member making the statement that Jesus is Lord, not only by their lips, but by their life. No man can say, no man can make a statement with his life that Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. And so that's the strength of every church. When every member acknowledges and submits to the Lordship of Christ, and becomes obedient to him in every aspect of life, that is the strength of any and every church. Then notice he talks about the ministry of the church. In the verses there before it, he talks about gifts. A gift is a supernatural capacity for service. God gives all men some kind of a gift. If you're here, you have a supernatural capacity for serving him who is Lord. And then the word ministry or administrations means a ministry. It means opportunity. It means we have a lot of ministry. We have a lot of ministrations. We have a lot of opportunities. God would give us gifts and then give us the opportunity to exercise those gifts. He said there are operations. Notice that word operations. That is power. So we have a supernatural capacity. We have opportunity. We have power. And then the purpose of these gifts is always worship and edifying of the body and evangelism to the center. So it gives us a ministry. It gives us the purpose of these gifts. They're not to bring attention to ourselves when God gives us a gift or even a talent. These are spiritual gifts, but God also gives us talents like to play the piano or to sing or to teach a class. But that's not to draw uh, attention to ourselves. It is to worship personally. It is to edify the saints of God, be a blessing to others, and it is to get the gospel out Uh, to those who need to be saved. Now notice, uh, I mean, this is, number one, an illustrative list of gifts. Notice back in verse 8, 9, and 10. He says there's a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, another faith, healing, verse 10, miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues. And if you go to Romans chapter 12, He lists other gifts that are mentioned there. So what a list this is, the list that God has given to uh, to members of a church to exercise, to help that church, edify that church, to build up that church, and then the power to go out in the community and be a witness for Christ. And so we worship through these gifts. We edify others through these gifts. We evangelize through these gifts. And so what a list there is. Now the gifts were always for the purpose of edification. It is the importance of unity. That's what he's getting at here. He says you may have a different gift. We all have different gifts, but we're one body. And so, and he goes through and he gives us the the uh, comparison to uh, a church to the body. He said you have hands, you have smell, you have um, uh, taste, you have 
uh, all kinds of parts to your body. And if something's missing, you don't have a complete body. But I believe that God gives to every church the people that it needs to operate. And so there is the importance of the body. Listen, no longer am I an individual. No longer is, is ministry about me. Uh, I'm a member of a body, so I must always take into consideration how will this affect the body? Selfishly, we want to say, how does this affect me? But that's not the question. I'm a member of the body. I'm a member of Middle Creek Baptist Church. How will this, if, if I do this, or I go here, or I don't exercise my gift, or I leave, how is that going to affect the body? And so their gifts are given because of the edification of the body, building up the body. Uh, we would say uh, a building is also called an edifice. It means that something that is built up from the foundation up. We build buildings, and they're called an edifice. They, are, they might be small, might be one floor, might be 100 floors, might be as tall as the Empire State Building, maybe taller than many other things. doesn't matter. In Ephesians and Colossians, Paul speaks of the church as a body. So again, when he addresses the Christians in Ephesus and in Colossae, he is telling them that they have spiritual gifts, and it all comes back to the unity of the body. And you notice in verse 12 and verse 27, it begins and ends with this thought of the body. You are the body of Christ. That's important. In Psalm 139, 14, he said, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. David was talking about his body. And he says, and that my soul knoweth right well. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And we could say that about our body. We could say it about the church. The church uh, was born uh, uh, again, and we came into existence back when Jesus was even with the disciples. The Bible said he called them unto himself. The church is a called-out group. And that's why he said, first were the apostles. And then there were prophets, and then there were teachers. He's not talking first in a place of priority, but first chronologically were the apostles. Secondly, you read the book of Acts, there were prophets, and then there were teachers in the churches. And so body is used 16 different times. And you know, if you, for those people who get cremated, you know what those ashes are worth? with all the minerals and everything in it, about $5. That's about what you're worth if you get cremated. Because you got calcium, you got lime and your bones, and then the other things that are there, uh, it, it comes down to about $5 worth. But that's not all there is to the body. The body was made by God Almighty. In the beginning, God created man and woman. And God gave them a body. And so this body physically is made by God Almighty. It was made in the image of God. He said in the image of God was Adam made. And of course Adam, Adam became Eve. And there is an eternal soul and a spirit for those who are saved. And it is eternal in his existence. This body will live forever in heaven. It will be a different kind of body. The Bible says there is a earthly body, but then there is a celestial body. The Bible says we shall all be changed in the moment of twinkling of an eye. So when Jesus comes or we die and go to heaven, we're going to have, still have a body, and we're still going to have just like this body, but it'll be a spiritual body, it'll be an eternal body, and it will never die, no, not ever, ever, ever. It will be eternal in his existence. That's what makes man different than every other part of creation, the animals, everything else, is that man has an eternal soul and a spirit, 
and they are eternal in their existence. The miracle of God's grace is shown when he when he saves a worthless sinner. Here's a sinner. I was a sinner. I was lost. I was worth about five bucks. And Jesus came and died for me, and he, and he convicted me of my sin. The Bible said he leads us to repentance and faith in Christ. And so we're part of the family of God. And just as supernatural is the placing of, of a saint into the local body. You've got to remember that Paul is talking to the Corinthian church. He's talking about the unity in the, in the church. He talked about it in the very first chapter. He's talked about it many other times in the first 11 chapters. And so he's talking about the unity of the body. And so the Bible says we are joined together. We are compacted. He has led us here by the Holy Ghost and baptized into the body. Now, the local body. Now, you, listen, in Paul's day, when he went to the city of Corinth and founded the Corinthian church, there was only one church in Corinth. There was only one church in Ephesus. There was only one church in Colossae. There was only one church in Philippi. And so when Paul started those churches, there was only one church. One local church. He didn't go into town and start five churches. Other apostles or prophets didn't come in behind him and start other churches. So there was one church. That's why he could use the uh, say that we were all baptized into the body, that one body that was in that city, led, saved by the Holy Ghost, led by the Holy Ghost to be baptized into that local church. Listen, there are some who just will not fit in. And uh, I, I want to be a member that is fitly joined together. I don't want to be one that sticks out like a sore thumb. No more individuality. I, it's not about me, it's about the body. Now I'm a member of the body. I, I was led here, baptized uh, of course, in a different church, but we accepted that baptism, and we're here by the Holy Ghost. To give some illustration, we had a dear brother in, in um, Oakland, Maryland, at Victory Baptist Church when I was pastor there, uh, Brother Murphy. Brother Murphy was lost. One of our members moved in across the road from him, lived out in the country on the country road, and uh, she would go over, and uh, uh, her and her husband were there at that time, and he died just a little bit later. But Brother Murphy, you know, she'd witnessed to him and his wife. His, his wife was absolutely, she hated Christianity, I guess. I don't know why. I don't know her background. But she didn't want anything to do with it. We'd have the young people go over, you know, at Christmas time, sing carols. She wouldn't come out. We, we you know, we wanted, to, we took hot chocolate and cookies and stuff to give them. She wouldn't even open the door. She wouldn't do anything. And Brother Murphy was so, you know, embarrassed by that. But he got saved. He finally started coming to church. And he came to church for several Sundays. And I remember he, he came forward one night, uh, well, probably a Sunday morning. And um, he, uh, he, he prayed, asked the Lord to save him. He came back the next Sunday and said, Preacher, I didn't get saved. He said, I don't know what the problem was, but he said, I, I don't have any peace. I didn't get saved. But a little while later, he got saved. He, got, he said, I got saved now. He said, I'm saved. And he began coming regularly and got baptized and all that. And then he, was, um, he worked on his own cars. He had a garage that by the side of his house. And uh, it had one of those oil pits in it, big square thing about six foot deep where he could get down under the car and change the oil and stuff, work on it. And... Um, one night he came in from hunting after dark. Now, he always had this big steel plate that he put across that oil pit so nobody would step into it in the dark or whatever. But he had forgotten to do that. And uh, um, anyway, he drove his four-wheeler into that pit and hit his head and killed him. Killed him. His wife so hated our church for some reason I don't know why we were nothing but good to her. 
uh, that she wouldn't have the funeral at our church. She didn't want me to have any part in it. So they were going to have it at a at a brethren church. And uh, so we went uh, to, uh, I went to the funeral. Now, I wasn't preaching. I didn't have any part in it. But while, while they, when they finished singing, I just stood up and said, I got to testify. And I came up front and I said, listen, I'm going to tell you, Brother Murphy got saved. He got born again. He's in heaven today. And if he were here, he could tell you all about it. And I just want you to know for the family, he is saved and born again. And uh, he was a member of our church and just, he was a good man and showed the evidence of salvation. I just testified for him about his salvation. And, uh, but if you notice in verses 12 and 14 and 20, it's all about the oneness of the body. Many members, one body. Many members in particular, but one body. And so he's, again, he's, he is uh, um, addressing this issue of unity. We're one body. If your body is out of joint, so to speak, you're going to be in pain. And that's why he said, he said, one, one hurts, we hurt. One rejoices, we rejoice. Because it's the body. So, notice this, there, there is an, got to be an understanding and an appreciation for the body. Now listen to me. You cannot, there's no self-depreciation of the body. Uh, they said, oh, I'm nothing. I wish I were like so-and-so. I wish I had their gifts. You know, I wish I had the gifts of so-and-so. No, no, no. You are saved, given your gift, and uh, you can't you can't talk bad about yourself and say, I'm not needed. No, you're a member of the body. And he talks about the comely parts and the uncomely parts. Some of our parts are beautiful, <laughs> comely, and some of them are ugly. And so he says, you can't say I'm nothing. You can't, you can't self-depreciate yourself. Neither can you... Um, depreciate other members and say I have no need of you that's what he says in these verses here so we ought to feel listen a dependency upon the body as a whole here it is the body of Christ we're, we're members of the same body we, in Paul's day he could say we were saved we were led by the Spirit to be baptized in the, that church that he had started, whether it be the Corinthian church or the Ephesian church, Colossians church, all the churches he started. And uh, there was not a bunch of churches in those cities. There was one church, and so he said, uh, because of that, we're saved and we were led by the Spirit to be baptized into this local church. And when a person is baptized, we've said it here before, they're baptized into the membership of the church. Now, if they've already been baptized in another church of like faith, the church that believes something, you know, what we believe, then we accept their baptism and accept their membership. So we ought to feel a dependency upon the body as a whole. The Holy Ghost... Baptized in one body, led there by the Spirit, baptized in the local church. He talks about fitly joined together, important to other people. The church ought to be important to me. It ought to be important to my life, my edification, my growth, my development as a Christian, my family, every member under the Lordship of Christ functioning and worshiping and witnessing and serving under its one head, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we do that, we will have unity that will bond us together and we will be unmovable and unshakable. Just like David said, I shall not be moved. Look at verse 24. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. Verse 28. And God hath set, notice that word, some in the church, first apostles, secondly third, uh, prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then the gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. 
The word set means it's he was, um, God has set some in the church. He ordained, he appointed, he put them into a place of a perfect position in that local church. He knows what gifts he has given to them. He knows how to lead that person to exercise those gifts for the good of the body, the, the local church. And so it is no no coincidence or accident that you are here. You are a member of the greatest organization on the face of God's earth, the local church. You are important. Listen, you're important. Every person's important. You have a job. You have a purpose. And church is not complete without you. I wish, I wish maybe it was Sunday morning, I wish everybody could hear this. I have no right to down myself, nor have I any right to down you. We have been placed here by the Holy Ghost, baptizing the body, giving gifts to encourage worship, edification, evangelism, to fulfill the will of God and the ministry that God has given to Miller Creek Baptist Church. It's more than an organization. The church is the living, breathing body of Christ on earth with its gifts, its ministry, and power available to exercise itself in love to the Lord. Notice this, more gifts. He, he talks about, first, there was apostles. Now think, uh, those apostles go all the way back to the life of Christ. And in the book of Acts, it was the apostles who started uh, in the upper room, chose one of those men to take the place of Judas, who had betrayed the Lord, and uh, who, was re who died, and now he's going to be replaced. And so the apostles are mentioned first. And then there were prophets. If you go to Acts, about chapter 12, it tells there's a prophet by the name of Agabus. And then in chapter 13, he talks about the teachers. There were teachers in the church. So there's apostles, there's prophets, and there's teachers. And we could define, or you know, let's go back to verse 8. For by one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. So God has given the, uh, a special gift of wisdom to certain members of the, word, uh, of the church. To another, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. And so he, he gives people uh, uh, the, uh, maybe a supernatural ability to understand spiritual things, understand the Bible doesn't mean that other people can't. It just means it comes a little easier for them. He says to another faith. You ever, you ever seen those people who just seem like they can trust God for anything, everything, it doesn't bother them. They have a, they have a gift, and it's a gift of faith. Everybody is to have faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But some people have the gift of faith. To another, the gifts of healing. Not long, in Acts chapter 5, the Bible talks about the apostles healing the lame man. And uh, there was all kind of healings through the book of Acts. And then in verse 10, he talks about the working of miracles. Some of those, probably mostly apostles, had the gift of miracles. They could, they could uh, work miracles. They could heal people. They had discernment. They had other things. To another prophecy. To another discerning of spirits. You remember in the book of Acts also, there were the seven sons of Sceva who were demon-possessed. And these uh, so-called uh, Christians went in to try to, <laughs> try to cast these demons out of this house and out of this person. And the Bible says the demons came out all right and they chased them naked out of the house. I mean, you don't, you, you don't do something you ain't gifted to do. And then the different kinds of tongues. We know in the book of Acts they speak in tongues. That's a gift that's passed away. We'll get into that in, in chapter 13. He says, when I was a child, I did childish things. And he mentions those tongues and other things that were childish things. It was things that 
certain gifts God gave to the church to authenticate who they were and that they were preaching truth. But when they didn't need that anymore, then those gifts gradually passed away. The interpretation of tongues. Um, and so he goes on to say, but all these, verse 11, worketh that one in the self-same spirit, dividing to every man individually, severally, as he willeth. And so there's got to be an understanding. Set in the church, important. You have a job, you have a purpose. The church, listen, is not complete without you. I don't have a right to down myself and say, well, I'm just, you know, I'm just a nobody. No, God, if you're here, you have a purpose. And it's more than an organization. It is the living, breathing body of Christ on earth. And then many gifts, one church, many members, one body. Diversities, he says, of different things, but one purpose, one goal. And that is the redemption of sinners, the edification of the body of Christ, and the glory of God. That's what we do. Now, the key to making all this work is in chapter 13. Look at verse 1. He says, though I speak, notice in verse 31 of chapter 12, but covet earnestly the best gifts, but I show unto you a more excellent way. He said, I'm going to show you something better than all the gifts. He says in verse 13, chapter 13, verse 1, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, that's love, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. You cannot play a tune on sounding brass or cymbals. They make the same sound no matter who they are, what key you're in. They just you know, just one one sound. And so he's saying in verse 2, although I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith that I can remove mountains and have not charity, love, I'm nothing. Here's the more excellent way. Love is the more excellent way. You can have the best gifts, but if you don't have love with it, he said you're nothing. You're nothing. Here's what's bring about the unity. It is a love for God, a love for the brethren, a love for the church. And we'll go through chapter 13 probably next week or on Sunday morning in the 10 o'clock hour. But listen, this, this is important that we understand who we are and why we're here and how we fit into the body and how important we are to the body and to every, every individual Christian. I am dependent upon you. You ought to feel dependent upon me. You ought to feel dependent upon one another. We're the same body. Now, um, thank the Lord I have not had any external members cut off. I do have a knee replacement. Uh, but, I, you know, that's part of the body but they replaced it with an artificial joint and it don't work still don't work right nothing like the natural body working together every joint supplying every need hands are important your eyes are important your hearing's important your legs your feet are important your your speech is important your 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 taste and your smell everything is important in the body i don't want to do without any of that and that's how we are in the local church. We can't do without anybody that's here. God put us here, put us together. We're in the same body, and we're to serve the Lord together, exercising our spiritual gifts for the edification of the body and to reach out into the community as one and be a witness to those who are lost. So let's value the body. Let's understand the body. Let's bow for prayer.